Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so we're starting a series of talks based upon Quranic and prophetic mannerisms. Now, what I find in society these days is Islam has really lost its original touch and its original meaning. What I mean by that is, people, when they seek Islamic knowledge, they, they, they go to do what is easiest or what is the bare minimum. So many of us, when we pick up a book of fiqh or we start learning about salah, we start saying, okay, let's leave off this sunnah, let's leave off this sunnah, let's just stick to what is absolutely basic and compulsory for us. And we find that in other parts of our lives, uh, life as well, such as uh, Jum'ah. So let's just say you, you're still within London or you're just outside London. And it's not really a, a big problem for you to pray Jum'ah, but you think, okay, I've met the requirements of a traveller now, I'm not going to pray Jum'ah. I'm just going to you know, combine or shorten your prayer, whichever is within your jurisprudence. So Islam has lost its spirituality. Islam has just become academics. It's, it's not about the core essence anymore. It's not, about, it's not about Allah anymore. It's about what am I doing. It's just a book of law. That's what Islam has become for people these days. Another side point that Islam has become for people is that people seem to have got the belief that Islam ends at prayer or they, they've become very secular in their Islam that Islam is, you know, I pray five times a day and the rest is whatever society tells me to do but of course as most of us here would know that's completely wrong our religion encompasses the best of all things whether that be in worship business our burial or within our social conduct our religion orders us to do the best of all things. <clears throat> the Qur'an, the speech of Allah, the citrion between truth and falsehood, is our means of salvation. The Qur'an is mainly comprised of stories, and then other sections are in uh, law and um, belief also. Now, one has to ask themselves how does one go about the Qur'an and, and what, what, what is this, the essence of the salvation? I uh, just skipped a point. The Qur'an itself, when I mention that the Qur'an is a means of salvation, it doesn't mean just in the hereafter sense. I don't mean that, okay, if you abide by the Qur'an, you will gain salvation in the hereafter. No, like I forget if it was Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn Qayyim, they said there is a salvation in the hereafter and there is a salvation in, in this world also. And if you achieve the salvation in this world, then you will gain the salvation of the hereafter. And the salvation in the hereafter can only be achieved through adhering to the Qur'an. And the salvation of the hereafter is your tranquility in your mind, in your property, and, in, and, and through your di how people treat you and how you treat them. That's your salvation. And m more than that, it's, 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 it's also the, your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you become so content with what is ordained for you and what Allah has ordered you to do, that all of these things become the tranquility and the salvation of this life. So what I skipped ahead to you earlier was the means to achieving this salvation of this life and the hereafter is through the Qur'an. So if an, a person implements the Qur'an into their life wholly and adheres to it fully and encompasses it in their life, then they will achieve it. But the question that arises, how does one implement the Qur'an? How does one practically take the message and the stories of the Qur'an and put it into their life? And the answer is quite simple. 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who Aisha radiallahu anha described him as the living Qur'an. He, when he spoke, he spoke Qur'an. When he dealt with you, it was Qur'an. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, nor does he speak of his own desire. You know, there was a... a the Quraysh, uh, it was either the Quraysh or the Munafiqeen, they said to the one Sahaba, you know, you shouldn't listen to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he's angry. Like you shouldn't listen to what he has to say because he's a man and at the end of the day, his anger might overcome him. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied that no, listen to me when I'm angry because I don't speak out of desire. Everything I say is revelation. So when we take Quran and Sunnah, for example, we shouldn't really make a distinction in what with the Sahih Hadith, of course, and the Mutawatir Hadith, especially when we look at what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has explicitly commanded us to do, and what the Quran explicitly com- explicitly commands us to do, we shouldn't make a distinction. Both are revelation from Allah subhanahu wa taala, and in the Quran, Allah also says. He who obeys the messenger is as if he has obeyed Allah. And also in the Quran, Allah says to, to love the messenger is to love Allah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Islam is three. Iman, fiqh and ihsan. So, Iman is to believe in Allah, the angels, his books. His messengers, the last day, and Qadr. Fiqh is those actions that you should do and should should avoid to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hope that you will earn His mercy and gain Jannah. So, you know, a lot of people, like bringing it back here, also the hadith that I mentioned, sorry, wait, I'll bring that later. On this point here, a lot of people become complacent, like I was saying earlier, about, you know, they, they make Islam, they try to do the bare minimum. But what we have to take into um, account is that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, even I will enter Jannah by Allah's mercy. So even the Prophet Muhammad wasallam will enter Jannah by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to look. Really and truly, am I doing enough to earn that mercy? Is the bare minimum enough? So yeah, that's fiqh. The actions one needs to do and one must avoid to gain the pleasure of Allah in the hope of gaining Jannah. And Ihsan, Ihsan is, Ihsan is to worship, is to have sincerity in your actions. To the extent that you are aware of Allah's watching you, that you are aware of His presence in in terms of His viewing you, not His physical presence here. Um, so, within the category of fiqh, it can be split into two. So this is this is where I'm talking about those uh, when I was mentioned. I tried to skip ahead about the people that are quite secular and say Islam is only worship. Fiqh can be separated into two categories. Those actions one does solely for Allah, like salah. Yeah, you pray, and that's for the benefit of Allah. Not benefit, but for His praising. And the second category is your dealings with creation. So, for example, if I buy something from Atisham, I have to obey the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my transactions. With him, and and also it's also like if I give him salam, if he gives me salam, it's far for me to reply. This is also another example of our social dealings and and the dealings with the interaction that come under fiqh. And it's in this section that we're mainly going to concern ourselves with the fiqh, especially. Um, Keeping ourselves concerned with the second category of dealing with the creation, but a little bit of our actions towards Allah as well. And it's this that mankind in general today 
has become neglectful of. You see people cheating people all the time, especially in business. People don't care. It, it's just like... Um, it, it, there's a, I can't remember the area. I went to the area and I was going to go to a meat shop to buy meat. And then the people from the local masjid said, look, don't buy meat there. I, was, I asked them why. They said they go Tesco and then they sell the meat and then they just put a halal sign there. That's, that's cheating Muslims on a completely different level. But I'm sure all of you know some stories or situations where people aren't sticking to this section of Islam. And it is a big part of Islam that is completely forgotten. So the Sharia, the Sharia in, in the sense that I'm using it here, Islamic law, is essentially fiqh, has five primary objectives. It is the preservation of one's religion, one's life, one's lineage, intellect, and property. And th this is what, with, with those dealings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for us, the ulama have derived these objectives from that to say these are the primary things that Sharia concerns itself with, or these are the primary th things that the Sharia tries to protect. So in the Quran, Allah says, And we have sent you, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but as a mercy to mankind, and not just mankind, alim means mankind, the jinn, and all that exists. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in, in a hadith he says that I was sent to, paraphrasing the hadith, he said, I was sent to perfect or, or, or give the best of manners. So this was his job. He was, he was sent to bring justice into the community through one, first and foremost, calling the people to tawheed so if they, they can get the hereafter salvation. And second, that they deal with each other in the best of ways so they can achieve that, that part of that salvation in this life. So just a quick question I'd like to ask everyone. Let's say there are some people that haven't received the Qur'an or they haven't received any revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can they be good morally upright people without any revelation just give up some opinion but don't be shy yes yes why because um, they could have a conscience and they could be brought up with just general information um, teachings of right and wrong Okay, but where, where, like, the one principle that they could live by could be simply understanding that they don't want to mistreat anyone else because they wouldn't like it. And on that basis, they could be just reasonable individuals that, that wouldn't cheat or misuse anyone's trust. Okay. But where did they derive that from? Uh, parents. And where did the parents derive it from? Their parents. It would no. ultimately or originate, I would assume, from... No, but I'm saying, saying, saying someone lived in the Amazon forest mm. and unfortunately, mm. for whatever reason, a messenger, if, if a messenger was sent to them, they, they mistreated him and the people completely got rid of the message and they killed it from their society. Mm. So these people grew up without any mm. um, Abrahamic religion. Okay. Then, yeah. then no, that like, might be close to animals then. You think they'll be so so no, no, not much difficult than this. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have any other opinion? Well they just chuck it out, just go for it. Like I'm not gonna kill anyone. Sheikh, do you know anything? Like chuck anything up? Yeah, they could of course they could have morals and manners. Morals and manners. Anyone else have any ideas? I think the brother was right in saying a conscience because I think the conscience is Okay, so essentially what everyone has said is completely right. I was just playing games with you with the with the but where did they get it from? Where did they get it from? Um he said that most this this is this what he was saying is more concerning can someone come to the understanding of monotheism 
and all the non-Muslims account, say if there was a non-Muslim that hadn't received revelation, are they accountable? And if they haven't really heard of Islam in its true sense, are they accountable? So what he said was, the human mind has the ability to derive the truth. As in, we have the facilities in our mind to look at things, analyze them and find the truth. And upon that, Allah does not test us on that. So Allah says in the Quran um, that he does not, paraphrasing, he does not test or punish the people unless a message has been sent to them. So Ibn Taymiyyah included that ayah and said, look, the human mind has the ability to derive the truth, but Allah does not test the people if a messenger or the message has not been given to them. So just on that point, there's two... two, um, Two uh, types of, like say, non-Muslims here One is one that doesn't get the message at all The second is one that gets a distorted message So for example, let's say in certain areas of England Where Muslims don't live And they have no Muslim friends And the only image of Islam they get Is a super hate-filled message on the media They don't really know Islam They just see some people dressed like this, running around doing some bad things and they think that's Islam so people, just like uh, making this example relative today those type of people according to Ibn Taymiyyah would not be accountable and on Yawm Qiyamah what would happen is an angel would be sent to them to test them so I, I, can't, I, I have in my mind some, the, what happens but I can't remember if it's exactly what happened so I won't mention it but um, another example was Ibrahim he rationally came to the conclusion of the existence of monotheism uh, you heard the story like is this my lord is this my lord so he rationalized it also there was a man in Mecca I can't remember his name this was before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam before he was given his prophethood he used to go around to the people of Mecca saying you don't follow the religion of Ibrahim You don't follow the religion of Ibrahim And he also met the Christians and Jews and said No, you've distorted the, the religion of Ibrahim So he completely ignored them And also, with, um, like you all said, the natural fitra So every human being is, has an understanding of the natural fitra And additionally, when Allah created Adam salam. He gave him the ability to know the names of things. So, in um, uh, uh, Bidaya Wan Nahaya, he's was Wan Nahaya. Yeah, he um, Ibn Kathir writes that what that means is, or what some of the Mufassirin have said, is that means that Allah gave Adam the ability to name things or to say like, okay. What is this? It's like this. I'm going to call it paper. So he said, that's one of the interpretations of that verse. So if we apply that to this, human, human beings have, uh, Allah has given them the ability to establish principles and derive things. So essentially, yes, human beings can be upright moral people without any revelation. However, the reason why, the, what, what we're saying is, we're not saying that um, non-Muslims are unmoral. What we're saying is, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he came with is the best of all morals, encompassing all things. So, yes, yeah, someone could be smart and derive things, but it's very unlikely that they're going to get everything right. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with the best of all things. So, that, uh, over the next few, every, every two weeks, we're going to go through a book called Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. And it's a book written by Imam Bukhari, which means, Al-Adab means, like, not mannerisms, but the right way to do things. And Mufrad is the other book. So, he's distinguishing it from the book in his Sahih. So, in... Imam Bukhari wrote Sahih al-Bukhari which he used the best of the best of the best hadith 
and then he decided, okay, the book of Adab in that is very, very small. So I'm going to write a more comprehensive book and I will include, okay, some not as strong hadith and sometimes even weak hadith to stress points. But it will comprehensively give the mannerisms of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba. Now, the way I'm, the reason what I'm going to go into now in a moment is the way in which I'm going to analyze these hadith for you. I'm not going to do your typical hadith lecture of this means this, this means this. What I want to do is try to give you an appreciation of the one the comprehensiveness of Islam. One, the miraculous nature of Islam So what I want to do is First talk about the fada'il The virtues of these morals And the second thing is to talk about their social effects So how do If a person has these social morals How does it affect their society around them? So That's what I'm going to attempt to Analyze, analyze it from a sociological And a spiritual sense so, in social Islam, within the studies of societies, there are two proposed ways you look at, um, just bear with me, if anyone like doesn't really know what I'm saying or, or isn't really following, then please let me know if I'm too, talking too fast, just stop me. And um, So yeah, there's two main ways that you analyse social, social uh, society. The first way is through um, a macro view which a macro view is when you take society as a whole and you only care about the functioning of society rather than how individuals are affected the second is micro micro is completely the opposite it doesn't care about the, the general function of society it cares about the individuals in society so just to introduce you to those two Now, Islam When we're going to talk about Islam We're going to describe it as an ideology Not a religion An ideology can be described very loosely As a way of life In which you derive Your, your norms and values Your morals And the way about you go from your, your life From a doctrine From a source That's an ideology so other ideologies can be uh, capitalism and communism. I'll just briefly go over them. Now, when people analyze capitalism in the uh, in in the positive, they look at capitalism generally from a macro perspective because ma um, capitalism generally doesn't concern itself with the individuals except for the upper class. So capitalism's main theme is that your main goal in life is wealth and how you go about that is wealth wealth is your success if you don't have wealth you're not successful so that is the central theme of capitalism what are the effects of that the effects of that if we see it in today's society is one it just turns into fascism and two your essentially what capitalism does is this it devalues the human life and the essence of the human life to such an extent that people kill other people for money. So money is more valuable than another human life. The other ideology that we're just going over, so you have a feel, is communism. Communism is similar in the sense that it doesn't care about the individual. However, it does the exact same Devaluation of human life How so? Um, it basically makes everything equal So you and a grain of rice Have the same value And a less extreme example is this That say there's a um, What do you guys consider a, a, Like a not so good job Like Someone brought a job that's considered You wouldn't expect them to be paid a lot Like you expect them to be paid virtually nothing a bin cleaner, okay. So a bin cleaner and a doctor in a communist society get the same wage. Now that's like that's just not yeah, 
they do get kind of a lot of money, but uh, but effectively you expect the doctor to get more. So um, that that's that's communism, and essentially what it does is what happens with communism most of the time is that some guy with a capitalist mentality takes over a communist society and just monopolizes everything and has a really good time. So, um, Islam. So, now analyzing Islam from a social perspective. Islam in, is very different in the sense that it's macro and micro. Islam has an overall objective to create something called an altruistic society. An altruistic society is one that is completely selfless. Like an extreme version is like, you know them Buddhist monks, where it's like they don't care about anything, they're giving everything away. So Islam wants to create a selfless society, but your selflessness is not to like, everyone here, it's towards Allah. So Islam, um, what it does there is it, it, it takes away the it, it takes away the initial individuality. So there's no like um, he's Pakistani, he's Somali. There's none of that. He's my Muslim brother, and he's my Muslim brother, and I'm their Muslim brother. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he likened the human body uh, the human body to the ummah, and what, what, um, so he likened the human body to the Ummah So we are one nation, one people under one banner However, through this initial goal Islam also seeks to not, uh, nurture the individuals He gives them, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the, like, For example, the right to profit, um, owning your own business Etc. Etc. And the evidence in terms of how Islam doesn't take away your individuality, it promotes your individuality, but also wants you to be under one banner. Is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female, and made you peoples and tribes, that you may want know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous." Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. So, essentially, just taking this ayah apart and applying it to what I'm saying here, is that Islam is saying, look, you be Pakistani, you be Somali, and I'll be a mix of two things. And then, you, I be, I'll be me, you be you, but we're Muslim brothers. And what makes us excel is our dutifulness and our love and and work and our fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is essentially our one banner and like I said already an example of how Islam orders society is one it has it kind of has a balance of the capitalism and communism here so it has public welfare so everyone's getting equal distribution it has free housing and it gives free access to water. So if there's a flowing stream, the king can't say, this is my stream, you guys pay me for it. No, that's the Muslim's property. So it has public property. However, you can, you can have your business and you can have a business, but Islam tries to prevent monopolizing. So people having, like, uh, like for example, like Tesco or something like that. Um, so as the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, Islam is the middle path Like with the, the story of the, the milk, the water and the wine And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He took the water as that's the middle path between the two So, are you guys okay with this? Like, you know, like be honest If you're finding like this a bit too much, the next week gets worse <laughs> So, okay Um how does Islam seek to achieve this? Like, if you, I, I would like go slowly with this if you're okay with it. Like, you guys seem like kind of tired on board. Mm. No, you're all good, yeah. Mm. Okay, so Islam tries to achieve its socialization. Socialization is the process by which a person is given their norms and values. 
values being your like your personal beliefs, what you, how you feel things should be. And norms are what you expect to be normal in society. So, for example, it's against the norms in this country at the moment for people to run around naked, but like the clothing seems to be getting less and less, so maybe in a few years that will be a norm. But yeah, so that's socialization. So what is the Islamic socialization process? And Islam does this in three stages. The first stage is the, unify, uh, the unification of all Muslims under one banner. The second is culturing of Muslims. And the third is now giving Muslims their individuality through giving them uh, dealing with their dealings with each other, legislation and accounting for their individual needs and identities. So the first, in the first stage of uh, unifying all the Muslims under one banner, Allah teaches, like for, for example, the Makkan verses were the first verses to be revealed. And in those verses of the Quran, Allah talked about Iman. He talked about, okay, the, the belief in Allah that we begin in the beginning, those six points. He talked about himself. He described himself to the believers. He also talked about Jannah and Jahannam. He talked about the unseen. So yeah, Jannah and Jahannam and various other things. Regarding under the unseen, what this what this initially does of giving so establishing la ilaha illallah is to unite all of us here, regardless of our cultural background, regardless of what la uh, languages we speak at home, reg regardless of whether we're rich or poor or our skin color. We all believe in Allah, and that unites all of us. So all of those other things don't matter anymore. All that matters is that. The second thing that Allah done was, He mentioned stories of the prophets. Now, this overlaps into number two as well, but what it initially does here as well is, it affirms the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. It also gives hope to the believers. Because during Makkah, the Muslims were oppressed. The Muslims were under oppression. The, the, the first martyr of Islam, Sumayyah, was killed during their time in Mecca. She was tortured and killed. So the Muslims, they needed also some motivation. So Allah told them stories of the prophets where the people had been under oppression and then they were successful through their patience and perseverance. It also teaches them through Jannah and Jahannam, meritocracy. Essentially, if you do good, you will achieve good. And if you do bad, you will achieve bad. So, this, then all of these things, especially the meritocracy and the belief in Allah, come together to achieve that altruistic society that I was talking about earlier. So, the... So um, the second stage is how from those stories of the prophets, the morals and the stories that were given there. So for example, with Ayub alayhi salam, he, was, he demonstrated immense patience. Nuh alayhi salam, uh, he demonstrated immense patience in his dawah. Look at the trials and tribulations, especially with Bani Israel. All, like Bani Israel, like for me, when I think of Bani Israel, I think that, look, if we're gonna, if we wanna like look at what's happening in the Muslim Ummah, let's look at what happened with Bani Israel, what they done is what we're gonna do. Because, you know, we like to, like, there seems to be a um, thing, like a popular culture with Muslims that have this kind of hatred towards Jews because of, obviously, like with the whole Zionism thing, but not all Jews are Zionists, but we have this thing where we're like, yeah, we're better than them. For, for some stupid reason, we feel like that, when in actuality, we seem to make all the same mistakes that the Jews of the, that the Old Testament, the Quran, and the, and the Bible itself all talk about. All those mistakes they made, we're making them. We seem like, okay, we haven't made a cow, 
But look at the idols we make in our societies. We take footballers as idols. We take them uh, like, you know, them, them eye things and like ta'wiz and things like that. We're taking all of these things in, but we seem to think we're better than them when we're making the same mistakes anyway. So in the second stage, these stories and these morals and the way about you, sh advices for your life, cultured the Muslims. And also um, an example of how the Muslims were cultured into a brotherhood is when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the muhajirun, those that went from Mecca to Medina, came to Medina, he said to the Ansar, take them as your brothers. He literally said, look, you're like, you're the brother of, okay, say you're the Ansar, you're the muhajirun. He said, okay, this uh, uh, muhajir is your brother now. Yeah, so you two are now brothers. And that's what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam done. Later on, that was abrogated, so there wasn't they weren't uh, officially brothers anymore, but brothers in Islam. And then in the third stage, Allah finally creates the legislation. So everyone's in Medina now. Everyone's living together. They believe in Allah. They're doing their deeds alone for Allah. And they have that brotherhood and they, they want to help each other. Now Allah tells them how they can be individuals while giving themselves away to Allah. That's, that's um, a side note I wanted to make. Um, the word Muslim. A lot of people say that you know, Islam means peace. When Islam, Muslim... They all come from the same root word, Sin, Lam, Mim, yeah, Salama, which doesn't mean peace, like Salam. It means Salam comes from it, but Salama means to. If I said, okay, like this, this would never happen. But if I said, Atisham, this phone of is now your phone, completely. That's yours, yeah. That's Salama. Yeah, so Muslim is someone who does that. So when you call yourself a Muslim, the way that I pretended to give it away <laughs> is the way you're meant to be giving yourself away to Allah. So in the third stage, Allah creates the legislation which a Muslim can do, uh, do their social dealing, their transactions, general laws, and also how they can in, um, express themselves as individuals whilst pertaining to the group identity of being a Muslim. So various surahs were, were revealed in the uh, Medinan phase dealing with social political ma matters um, such as marriage, uh, finance, international relations, war and peace. Um, even though even though there, now there was like a level of freedom, so you can have your business, like you can do this, you can do that, you're, you're, we're together but you're doing your thing now. Though the freedom was given, there is strict accordance to the Muslim group and the Muslim ruler. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, obey the Muslim ruler, even if he whips your back and takes your money. So essentially, the main part of being Muslim is the collective nature of being a Muslim and sticking together as a group. However, that collective nature and sticking to the group does, isn't a means to oppress the people. So when I said obey, uh, obey the Muslim ruler, even if he whips your back and takes your money, that doesn't mean you, you, Islam is seeking to oppress you or to put you under oppression. And an example of how the individual is protected and the individual is cared for, like I said, it's micro too, is the example of Ali radiallahu anhu. When the Jewish man stole his armor, Ali uh, radiallahu anhu's armor, and he tried to claim it back. So he took Ali radiallahu anhu was the Khalifa, the leader of, he was the Muslim ruler. So he took this Jewish man to court. So the Muslim judge said to him, produce a witness. 
And he couldn't produce a witness that that armor was his armor other than his son. And his son is not an appropriate witness. So what happened? The Jewish man beat the Muslim ruler in court. And even though it was, un it was uh, in the sense that it was an injustice to Ali radiallahu anhu, but it shows that the Islamic legal system is not biased. It's not by this man was a Jew. It was unbiased towards him because he was a Jew. It was unbiased to everyone else just because Ali radiallahu anhu was the leader of the Muslims. And if I remember, after the Muslim man saw the just the, sorry, the Jewish man saw the justice of, of this system and witnessed it, he decided to accept Islam. So it's through this belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that cultivates the best social conduct and encourages the best social conduct. Now, I just wanted to talk about the political strength of Islam here, coming from Tawheed. When I say political, politics generally has a dirty name these days and is perceived quite dirty. What, what I mean by politics is the management of people. So how and how you manage people, that is the that is my definition of politics here. So Tawheed, believing in the oneness of Allah and Iman in general, is the core political strength of Islam. It's what allows Islam to create the altruism or that selflessness in society. And whilst the individuals maintain their individuality so just coming back here what i mean by this selflessness as well is you remember when i was talking about the communism how everything's equal in a sense that's selflessness because everyone's doing their bit for society and everyone's getting equal and on the flip side capitalism everyone's in it for themselves looking to get the most money but the islam is taking a bit from here and a bit from there and saying look Let's be one people who are all equal in the sense of our level except for our taqwa. However, if you're doing, if you're a doctor, you deserve to be paid like a doctor. And if, like the brother said, you're a bin man, then you deserve the wage of a bin man. That's what you're doing. Each, each job has its own value and you should be paid according to that value. Now, an example of this altruistic thing in a more... Bigger example, a sociologist called Durkheim had a theory, uh, he describes this as altruistic suicide. The reason why I'm quickly establishing this here is I don't want people to get me the wrong way before I go into this. So an example of Islam's political strength regarding its belief is mainly shown in warfare, which is towards something that can be considered a altruistic suicide which means you will give your life for the greater cause of things you will selfless, selflessly give your life so you give your life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so obviously in Islam that concept is known as a shaheed now you guys understand why I have to say the Durkham bit first in case anyone misunderstands um, like I didn't want people to misunderstand my use of the word suicide I don't mean that in any way shape or form and that is not a shaheed. So, when a person becomes a shaheed or performs the altruistic suicide, they give themselves solely for the sake of Allah. They do it without any financial or political gain or personal gain at all. It's this political strength to drive people to do selfless acts that gives Islam its overall strength in all matters over other ideologies. Like, let's take this into context now. How many rich bankers are going to give their lives away to support capitalism? The moment they realize capitalism is under attack, they're gone. Even though they're, the f they're propagating capitalism to the fullest because they're the, one who are benefiting, they're the ones benefiting from it. But when push comes to shove, they're gone. They're not getting involved. Islam, however, the people that are propagating it the most will be willing to go into a just war for the right causes and be willing 
through the efforts of the warfare, if it came to it, fighting till their last breath. Uh, and a great example of how Islam has this political strength is, let's take a look at um, America. Who thinks that, like just a quick question, if America wanted to establish a law, who thinks that America has the political strength, the army for it, and the money to establish a law? Who thinks that it's fairly easy to establish any law they want? Yeah. You think they can? They can establish what they want. Let's look at what happened when America tried to ban alcohol. So, in between the years um, 1920 to 1933, the USA legislated a ban on the production, distribution and consumption of alcohol. The result of this 13-year ban was organized crime. The famous gangster Al Capone made his legacy during the prohibition. He, look, there's movies about him now. He made his money, his fame, and got movies and books written after him. The other result was illnesses. The one, there was um, illnesses down to the production of alcohol, which is a very dirty process when it's done in like, uh, who watches movies? What, um, what's that um, movie where the guys like it's some? Um, it's irrelevant. I can't remember the name of the film. But he produces alcohol and it's literally in the back of a shed underground. And he, in the movie, the guy's coughing because he's getting ill from the alcohol. The other illnesses that were spread was illnesses res related to drinking too much alcohol. Let alone that the alcohol produced was not of a um, safe. Uh, it wasn't really safe, it was a bit dodgy, it, it's, um, I think they call it moonshine, that's the type of alcohol that was produced. The other thing was, in the, for, um, scholars, American scholars said that in the year 1925, so that's five years into the ban, the actual American population increased their consumption of alcohol by 80%. So America said, listen, alcohol is haram. Now 80% are drinking more. Um, yeah, so the ban on alcohol lasted 13 years, but despite that, they couldn't remove alcohol from the hearts and the mouths of the people. So, let's look, have a look at what um, Islam has to say when it came to banning alcohol. I'm just going to narrate a hadith too. The hadith is narrated by Anas. And it goes like this The alcoholic drink which was spilled was al fadiq I used to offer the alcoholic drink to the people at the res residence of Abu Talha Then the order of prohibiting alcoholic drinks was revealed And the Prophet ordered somebody to announce that Abu Talha said to me Go out and see what this voice is I went out and on coming back I said there is somebody announcing that alcoholic beverages have become prohibited. Abu Talha said to me, go and spill it. So look, someone said, he hasn't even heard it from the Prophet Muhammad wasallam personally. He said, I heard someone else say that it's banned. So he's saying, take the alcohol that we're currently drinking and go spill it. And um, then it, the, the Al-Fadih, was seen flowing through the streets of Medina where the people of Medina were spilling this drink non-stop and the hadith goes on about asking about the people who drank alcohol before its prohibition and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran they're not going to be punished for what they used to do um, Al-Fadih is, uh, is a drink made from dates they didn't have alcohol made of uh, grapes in that time, in case anyone wanted to know. So, just uh, now going away, that's the end of our socialistic Islam here. Just looking about some general virtues of learning mannerism. Um, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, he said that when a Muslim has like five protections from shaitan. So 
the first of these protections is one's morals. The second is a Muslim's sunnah, the sunnah that they offer. The second, uh, sorry, the third is the fard actions that you perform. The second, uh, the fourth being a individual's ikhlas. And the fifth being your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, the moment you let your manners slip, that's when your sunnah goes, that's when your fard goes, that's when your ikhlas goes, and that's when your yaqeen, your, sin, your firm belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes. There's a, a man, his name was um, Ibn Wahab. He was a te- one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari, and he himself was a student of Imam Malik. He said, I studied with Imam Malik for 20 years. In one of those years, I studied fiqh. And the other 19, I sat with him and learned manners. And I wish all 20 years were learning manners from him. And some of the Salaf, they also said, when, before we learned fiqh from Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, we learned manners from him. Now, um, just kind of rounding this up here. When I said that in the beginning... Muslims these days they, they, they learn Islamic knowledge. Some there's a lot of Muslims that are keen to learn Islamic knowledge, but they learn it for the wrong reasons. It's like they wanna either they wanna do it because they wanna show off knowledge, they or they just wanna know, or like sincerity is that if you have knowledge then you should be practicing it. Everything that you've learned about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of his daily dealings for example. Like a quick example, if we, we know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he started his day with miswak and a smile. So knowing this, we should try our best to bring that into our lives. So sincerity goes that if you have the knowledge, you're acting upon it. But what people do these days is either they're just learning for the sake of learning or learning to debate others, which is the general theme of today. Like... You know, people want to argue about, like, uh, in what way do we believe that Allah has a hand? Or where is Allah? Or all of these kind of things. People are so busy arguing about them that they actually learn this to debate. They don't learn for their own benefit. And the same goes with fiqh. And there's another principle. It's like people learn, but now because they, ha- they understand the difference between fard, sunnah, makru, and haram, they're saying, okay, I won't do haram, but I'll do makruh. I don't need to do sunnah, but I'll do far. Now, these people is one, okay, I'm not going to say they lack ikhlas, but what they lack is manners. Because when you go learn something, it should be, it's the mannerism that you enact it. It's the, first of all, it's the etiquette to that knowledge, to that hadith. Of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That you learn it That you incorporate into your life Imam Bukhari actually said that The best way to memorize a hadith Like and look at You know How many hadith do you think Imam Bukhari knew of Baha? Guess Like in the Sahih If you took away the In his Sahih al-Bukhari If you took away all the repetitions There's about 2,700 hadith so how many hadith do you think he knew off by heart with the chains of narration? What about 4,000? No. He knew 600,000 hadith off by heart with the chains of narration. And he said, take it from a master of memory, the best way to learn a hadith is to act upon it. Because if you know a hadith and you act, do it, you don't need, like, you know that hadith because you're doing it every day. So the mannerism of seeking knowledge in the sense is that you're incorporating in your life. So, and on top of that, if you have, when you incorporate the correct manners towards things, so you, there's a certain mannerism to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. That, firstly, that we don't play with the Qur'an in the sense that we don't just sit there and, you know, like, I don't really know anything, I start interpreting it for myself. Or, I start interpreting Allah in the way that He describes Himself, 
with my own intellect, for example. No, that's not okay. We use what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described to understand Allah. Likewise with Islamic knowledge, there's certain etiquettes. And the etiquettes of it is to seek it sincerely, to incorporate in your life and to actually try to learn it. So if we have mannerisms with Islamic knowledge, then we progress. The other side point is in a general, in a general basis of life, if you incorporate these, uh, there's the narration of saying that um, if you seek to pe please the people, then Allah would be displeased with you and the people would be displeased with you. But if you seek to please Allah, then even if the people are initially hating you, then Allah will say, I love so and so. And then He will tell the angels, I love so and so. Then the angels spread it and then it will get down to mankind. We can see that. For example, take Imam Bukhari for example The 600,000 hadith that he knew He incorporated every single hadith into his life Every single hadith To the extent that When he was, um, there, was there was a hostel in the town of Bukhara Where he was from And um, the hostels for the travellers And that used to be what used to happen in the Muslim town They used to have like hostels Where travellers could come, eat, sleep for free So Imam Bukhari both funded and helped to build this So his students, he had bricks on his head Building this, yeah Imagine the man who wrote Sahih al-Bukhari Building a, a hostel So his students said to him Ya Sheikh, relieve yourself, you know, we'll do it and he said, no, no, like he's already written Sahih al-Bukhari. And he said, no, this is for my akhirah. I need more, I need more. One, he had the ikhlas. Second, he knew when the masjid was being built in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had bricks on his head as well. So he was a man that encompassed everything he knew. So if you incorporate back to the salvation in this life and the hereafter part of incorporating these mannerisms isn't just the effect that they will have on other people so if you're being good to your mother naturally your mother will love you more it's not just that Allah because you're emulating the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah will send love into the people's hearts now uh, another point on Imam Bukhari Imam Bukhari towards the end of his life had so many tribulations People were kicking, like you, you guys probably won't believe it unless you've looked into the story of Imam Bukhari. He, he, from his own hometown, he got kicked out and banished. The people said, we don't want you here. From his lessons where it had, on average, roughly 40,000 students, all of them left except for two. Imam Muslim and um, uh, a man called Ibn Adam. All, so all of... So what's that? The 38,000 students left him And then eventually the people kicked him out Of his hometown So imagine, where do you brothers live? Like on average Like, you guys live local? Yeah, so imagine the people of Leighton said to you Get out, we don't want you here Like that's going to break your heart Now imagine the status of Imam Bukhari as well He got kicked out Now Do you guys know the names of the people that kicked him out? That's the point no one remembers the people that hated Imam Bukhari But people remember Imam Bukhari Even though in that time he felt That he was being wronged He kept his manners And he kept his morals And he kept obeying Allah But look at his status now And there's one man His name was um, Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Yahya Thulathi he was one of the main propagators against uh, Imam Bukhari And he called him a man of bid'ah And if I get time at the end, we'll go through Imam Bukhari But he called him a man of bid'ah And no one, this man was a great muhaddith in and of himself He was the sheikh of Bukhara But no one remembers him Except for the man that had a fight with Imam Bukhari Imagine this man's name is tainted for life That's how much love Allah had for Imam Bukhari That he preserved his name So 
in essence, obeying the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, sticking to his sunnah, keeping his morals into his life, and this, like uh, the Hadith Qudsi says, that a servant doesn't draw closer to me, but by um, fulfilling his farad actions, and then his sunnah, and then his nawafil. So if you're including the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah will love you. And if Allah will love you, the angels will love you. And then this happens until all of the creation loves you. And look how Imam Bukhari is loved today. So, just to round off the whole mannerism section, um, just to remind everyone that our purpose here for this series um, is one, to learn the manners of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And second, to bring the mercy that we discuss into our general societies. Also, it's these manners that brought millions to Islam. The manners of the Prophet Muhammad These manners caused the Sahaba to fight over collecting the water of wudu dripping off the arms of the Prophet Muhammad So, um, yeah, let me just check if I have Essentially enough time here. Okay. Um, okay, well, that was like an hour. I didn't expect that to be an hour. Um, okay, so for the that's an hour, right? No one checking. Yeah. So um, for the next lesson, inshallah, we'll do the biography of Imam Bukhari and introduce Al Adab Al Mufrad, which will be the main book that we're gonna take things from now. The next, the next, like in in two weeks, the lesson isn't gonna be so heavily focused on sociology. We're gonna look at the hadith. We're gonna look at the benefits of the hadith, and maybe we'll take maybe five minutes to appreciate the social effects. So, the the, the main purpose of this lesson was just to give you an idea, and also to make you think that look, especially with that with the section where I was talking about the political strength of Islam. How Islam trumps every other ideology with no debate. It just defeats them. No ideology has as much strength as Islam does. So, Jazakallah Khairan for all of you listening. May Allah give us the ability to benefit from this and myself as well.